Good afternoon. Okay, so we'll just go th- start with the reflections on the top of page 31. It's kind of a review of the section that we just covered and asking us to relate it to our lives. Okay, so this can be for your meditation too. Examine the role of craving in your life. What do you crave? Do these things actually satisfy you when you get them? The big question. So, especially if you think of the eight worldly concerns, what do you crave and does it satisfy? Then second, does craving come from outside yourself? Is it from a creator, another person, the object that you crave? So does the object make you crave it? <laughs> okay. And how is craving related to ignorance? And third, what do you do under the influence of craving? So really, you know, look at your life. What craving motivates you to do? And what are the results of those actions? And then fourth, Make a strong determination to overcome ignorance and craving by practicing the path. Okay, that's going to take a while. Craving's strong, isn't it? It's really strong. And especially if we don't catch it when it's weak, it just completely overwhelms us and runs the show, and we're left like going... (laughs) Like this, yeah. Okay, so there are a couple of questions from the morning. Are permanent phenomena dukkha? No. Okay, I wouldn't think so. Um, For example, are mental images, conceptual appearances, true dukkha? We can generate uh, afflictions in relation to them. So it seems like they could be, but they do not fit into the example of the five aggregates. So conceptual appearances, you know, the uh, when we close our eyes, the image we have of something, how it looks or how it sounds or smells or tastes or feels, those are conceptual appearances. They're not the actual object, okay? And they're the product of a conceptual mind. By and large, in the tradition, they're regarded as being permanent. But many of us have questions about that. And how could they be permanent? So like this, it seems like if you focus on an object of attachment or aversion, that that uh, conceptual appearance is generating the affliction in your mind. So someone might say, no, it's not the conceptual appearance. It's the mind to which that appearance appears that is generating the affliction in your mind. But it kind of seems like it should be the the conceptual appearance too. And it seems like it should be produced. But they're, um, they're very strong that... Uh, a conceptual appearance is formed by the process of negation. So it's the opposite of everything that isn't that object. And so it must be permanent. I'm telling you all I know. Don't ask me about it. Ask a Geshe. This is a Geshe question. Okay, and I've asked many times, and I don't understand it so that I can explain it. Okay, and I'm not sure that I even agree. Okay, so there you have it. Um, Now, is that conceptual appearance, does it arise in conjunction with ignorance? I would think so. Yeah. Does that make it polluted? Yes. Does it necessarily make it afflictive? Not necessarily. 
Okay. And then the second question, can you elaborate on how the syllogism for causes proves that craving and karma are the chief causes of dukkha? You people are asking hard questions today. So the syllogism was craving and karma are the causes of dukkha because they are the chief causes of dukkha. So that seems like kind of a funny syllogism, you know, um, because you would first have to know that they're the chief causes of dukkha before you know that they are the causes of dukkha. And that seems like a, a funny order that, that that would go in. So I'll, give, I'll share with you my guesses of maybe what it means. That this particular one, it's the first of the four uh, attributes of true, uh, true afflictions, no, true origins. And it is, uh, its point, this particular one, is to negate uh, the idea that dukkha is random and causeless and happens ha uh, haphazardly. So in order to refute that, you have to show that it has a cause. Yeah. So by emphasizing, you know, it's the cause, that's what you're trying to prove, because they're the chief causes, maybe it's because, you know, the, the person that you're trying to help understand this is saying, oh, there's no causes, or the causes are, you know, it fell from the sky, or, um, you know, Mara did it, or, uh, you know, some other thing kind of hinting that there was no causes at all. Um, maybe it's something like that. You know, I can't say for sure. It doesn't satisfy me either. Okay? So you think about it and see what you come up with. Okay? So don't, you know, don't expect me to come up with all the answers, please. <laughs> yes? So at our, like, gut level, the eye feels permanent and very solid and independent of causing conditions. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if that is the permanent unitary independent self or inherent mm -hmm. self that has the quality of permanence and... It, yeah, I had the same question too. That's the inherently existent self. Because, and I, I kept saying, but it feels, it, the one of, of uh, the soul, it, that, those words describe this, how I'm feeling, you know? But then I thought about it some more, and the one of a soul is one that is completely made up. It's not an innate feeling that everybody has. It's something that philosophers created because they're trying to explain how karma goes from one life to the next. So, you know, because this has always been the big question um, for both Buddhists and non-Buddhists, is how does karma go from one life to the next? Well, oh, we don't really know, but if there's a permanent soul, yeah, that's unitary, so it's not going to get scattered into little bits, it's not going to change, it's not influenced by causes and conditions, but don't ask me how that karmic seed is influencing it, because it's permanent, so nothing can... But... You know, so this thing, you know, that we create by our ideas, that is what carries the karma from one life to the next. So that well, the same person experiences the effect as created the cause. Okay? So you have to have some theory about how that happens. So that's one of them. Okay? But the feeling we have, you know, is more along the inherently existent one or maybe the self-sufficient, substantially existent one. Okay. 
Okay, now the four attributes of true cessations. So true cessations include the cessations of various levels of afflictions that are actualized as we progress through the paths to our hotship and full awakening. Prasangikas add to this that a true cessation is the purified ultimate nature of the mind that has removed that level or portion of afflictions. Okay, so the prasangikas equate emptiness with true cessations Although they're not exactly the same, but they're kind of the same, okay? Um, in the Pali tradition, you know, they, they talk about nirvana being the, uh, the absence of the afflictions because they've been cut off by the true path. And that's explained as nirvana also by the prasangikas. The, the Pali tradition also says that nirvana is your object of meditation when you break through to uh, become an Arya and, uh, you know, you, you've um, understood the three characteristics, impermanence, dukkha, and not self, which in the Pali tradition are considered mundane or worldly topics and realizations. And you've penetrated those to see nirvana. So nirvana is some, you know, permanent, unborn state. It sounds in many ways like it could be emptiness, but they don't describe it exactly that way, but it kind of sounds like it could be, yeah? But there's many true cessations because there's many different grades of the afflictions. And when you uh, cut off each grade, then there's a true cessation of that portion of the afflictions. And then when you go to the next level, you cut off some more, and the next level, you cut off some more. And there's a whole detailed path, about 81 levels of afflictions, and all the various ways you can cut them off, either one, two, three, up to 81, or all the ones together, the two, you know, because there's nine realms that you can put them in, so all the ones are abandoned together. And so that's all explained in the next uh, volume. Okay, so stay tuned. An arhat's true cessation of all afflictions and karma causing samsaric rebirth is taken as the example. So in each of these um you know, of the four truths, there's something that is taken as the example, and then the four attributes of that truth applied to that example. So here it's the arhats to cessation of all afflictions and karma that cause samsaric rebirth. So this true cessation in the continuum of an arhat is the cessation of innate afflictions that have existed since beginningless time, okay, that come with us from one rebirth to the other effortlessly, as well as the acquired afflictions that we learned from incorrect philosophies. Now, the innate ones clearly are more serious because uh, they've been there since beginningless time, and they just automatically come with us as we go on to the next life. But the acquired afflictions also are quite serious, and they are the source of a lot of problems in our lives. So, okay, dare I mention identity politics? Okay, creating an identity for yourself based on religion, race, ethnicity, weight, height, um, 
whether you like chocolate or not, all the, you know, whether you are abled or disabled, whether you can, you know, all these different ways that we develop identities. You're young, you're old, you're strong and capable, you're weak and infirm. We have so many identities, our nationality, okay, our socioeconomic class. What? Gender. Gender, gender yeah. Um, gender orientation, all these kinds of things, okay? These are all acquired affliction, you know? The, well, the identities aren't, but are holding on to these as this is what I am. Those are all uh, created just in this life because in our previous lives, in our future lives, not all these things, these characteristics are going to be the same about us. Now, of course, grasping on... Uh, onto these acquired ones, stems, the root is the innate ones, the tendency to grasp and create identities. But the identities that we create, that we are attached to, that we demand everybody relate to us according to our identity, and that they don't relate to us in other ways that we don't think they should, all of this is learned in this life. Because you can see it when little kids get together, they don't notice these kinds of things. Okay? It's when you start learning and you watch the adults around you that then these conceptual things arise. Okay? So... These kind of acquired afflictions can be quite damaging. And I think very much here of what happened in the Balkans when Yugoslavia dis dissolved, okay? And the Croats and the Serbs and the Macedonians and everybody is killing everybody else when they used to all be part of the same country. Why? Well, however many years ago it was, my ethnic group fought with your ethnic group, and you slaughtered us. And now, you know, we have to stick up. We're not going to let ourselves get pushed around. So we are defending our ethnic group against yours because of what happened 100 years ago. Okay? So if you look at it, you know what's another good example? The Armenians and the Turks. Okay? Are you going to call what happened to the Armenians after World War I or during World War I by the Turks, are you going to call that genocide or not? Now, it's incredibly important what word you call this. Yeah, The Turks say it absolutely was not genocide. We did not conduct genocide against the Armenians. The Armenians say, yes, you did. Our people were savagely killed by you because we were Armenians. So to this day, they are fighting over whether to call it genocide or not. And the U.S. is kind of in the middle. Some people say, yes, we should call it genocide. And some people don't want to offend Turkey. So they say, no, it's not genocide. But then other people say, we have to stick up for human rights. So it is. So, you know, there's no clear cut thing. But what word you're going to call this? Yeah. And it happened... Uh, you know, a hundred, over a hundred years ago, none of the people who are alive today who are arguing about this were alive then. So here you have two groups of people fighting over something that was not done to them personally, 
but was done to the group they identify with. And so because people in their group were harmed, they feel they are personally harmed and they want retribution. Okay. And so the conflict continues. You know? And when you think about it, how many conflicts in this world continue from one generation to the next, or maybe they skip a generation in there. But precisely because people have that idea of these people harmed my people, so therefore I have an obligation to defend my people, even though I wasn't even alive at that time, and even though at the time it happened, I could have been one of the people on the other side. But this life, I'm born on this side, so I've got to attack the other side. And those people are saying the same thing. Okay, So it's possible that in the previous life, okay, that that the the uh, roles or the identities of these people were exact opposite. The, Ara the Israelis could have been Palestinians in the previous life, and the Palestinians, the Israelis, okay, uh, and the Chinese could have been Tibetans in their previous life, and the Tibetans could have been Chinese in their previous life. But whatever we are in one life, we hold on to it very strongly, yeah, and, uh, and form an identity about it. And that identity influences so much of the way we uh, not only think, but how we treat other people and how we want other people to treat us. Yeah. And when you think of how we can change so much in samsara, then you really see how pathetic it is when we attach to identities and hate other people because of what they did to our group when we weren't even born, or even we were born, yeah, because of this, this thing of, you know, this is I, this is mine. Yeah. It's really pretty tragic when you think about it, isn't it? Yeah. And so totally unnecessary. And yet, when we don't have this understanding, you know, our mind is, it takes this so seriously. Hmm? Okay, so those are acquired afflictions that we learn. Yeah, so, you know, different religions you learn in Sunday school, different things. And when you're young, you know, your mind just kind of absorbs. So you kind of believe that, whatever the adults told you. And then when you're older, you start thinking about it and you go, mm, well, I don't know. But then sometimes that thought still lingers in you because you learned it when you were so little and you're afraid to give it up because, well, maybe it was right. Yeah. So one of my friends who's a Dharma teacher, he was telling me about one person who came to see him once who was Christian and who wanted to become Buddhist but said, I'm so afraid if I become a Buddhist, I'm going to go to Christian hell. But if I remain a Christian, then I'm going to go to Buddhist hell. Yeah? So those kind of things, they stick in the mind. And, and we, uh, it's a, we don't even, so often, we don't even notice them because we learned them when we were so young. But they're, they're based on concepts. You know, that we made and then we cling. So some people don't like to hear this. <laughs> yeah. Because, wait, you're, this is my identity. Are you telling me that, you know, 
my identity, who I was raised with, is worth nothing? Yeah, but, 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 all these other people who are like me suffered. And so sometimes we don't like to hear it. But there's the choice of either holding, clinging to that identity, or saying, I don't want to be limited by that. Yes, you know, you can give me different labels based on different things, but my practice is cultivating love and compassion for all beings, not partiality towards my group. Mm-hmm. Okay, so Prasangikas assert that the true cessations of the course for truths are not actual true cessations because eliminating the ignorance, grasping a self-sufficient, substantially existent person does not eradicate true dukkha and its origins. Although it will temporarily stop the manifest course afflictions explained in the two knowledges. Two knowledges, treasury of knowledge, compendium of knowledge, by Vasubandhu and Asanga, respectively. Okay, So the Prasangikas also assert that a Buddha's true cessation is also the cessation of the cognitive obscurations that prevent full awakening. So the difference between an arhat's true, full, an arhat's complete uh, true cessation and a Buddha's complete true cessation. So, they, you know, the Prasangikas would say the arhats have realized the emptiness of inherent existence. They have ceased the afflictive obscurations, but they haven't ceased the cognitive obscurations. So it isn't complete in that respect. Okay. But just, you know, eliminating the thought of a self-sufficient, substantially existent self is not enough to attain liberation because the root of cyclic existence is still there. Even though that that grasping at that self and all the afflictions that arise from that have been temporarily suppressed. Those of you who um, uh, were here when Geshe Yeshe taught us last year, This came up in the teachings at that point. So the four attributes of true cessation address concerns that you may have. If you believe that afflictions exist inherently in sentient beings so that a state of final peace is impossible, reflect on the first attribute. So there's some people who believe that. Liberation is impossible. We sentient beings are biologically hardwired to have attachment, anger, jealousy, and so forth, because without those emotions, uh, you know, we would be subject to be killed by predators. So we have to have fear, we have to have anger in order to survive, and this is biologically hardwired in us. Okay, some people say that. Okay, and so they say it's impossible to eliminate these afflictions, you know, unless you want to take out your amygdala or some other part of your brain. Yeah. If you wonder is heaven, if heaven is better than nirvana, because you've heard about heaven and how nice it is and you get to be with your relatives forever. (laughs) Yeah? Um, Then contemplate the second attribute. Okay? Is heaven really better than nirvana? And some people may say, yes, I'm in heaven. I still exist. My relatives still exist. You know, we we have a delightful life with no problems. Nirvana, it just seems like all you do is sit there and 
meditate on your belly button, you know. So heaven's more interesting. There's all sorts of beliefs in, in samsara, aren't there? I mean, so many different ideas. If you think that nirvana isn't total freedom, okay, that there's some higher degree of freedom, then reflect on the third attribute. And if you wonder if it's possible for nirvana to deteriorate, contemplate the fourth attribute. Okay, and this was actually uh, a topic of, of conversation during the time of King Ashoka. There was a lot of debate about if somebody could become an arhat and then lose that realization and be an ordinary being again. Okay, so the four attributes of true cessation are cessation, peace, magnificence, and definite emergence. Okay. The, uh, the term definite emergence is translated into Tibetan and then into English as renunciation. Not definite emergence, but it's the same uh, Pali Sanskrit Tibetan word. Okay, so first, nirvana is the cessation of dukkha because it is a state in which the origins of dukkha have been abandoned, and it thus ensures that dukkha will no longer arise. Okay, so when the causes of dukkha have been abandoned from the root, then they can't arise again. When you, uh, all of you who, who have pulled knapweed, okay, if you've been at the Abbey any period of time, you know all about napweed. Well, maybe not all about it, but a good lot. If you pull the napweed out and it breaks near the bottom, you've got the part of the plant that's above ground, okay? But you haven't gotten the root out, and that napweed will grow the next year from that root. So you have to make sure you pull out the root, okay, to prevent it growing again. So it's the same thing with the afflictions. Unless we cut them, uproot them, yeah, they will come back in one form or another. So thinking that afflictions are an inherent part of sentient beings, some people believe that trying to eliminate them is futile. You know, sentient beings are selfish by nature. They're attached to themselves, and this was what enables them to stay alive as biological beings and not be slaughtered by predators. And so the afflictions are good. They can't be abandoned, and anyway, we don't want them to be abandoned because then we might all die. Okay, so that kind of view. Um, so these people do not try to remedy their situation and consequently continue to be reborn in cyclic existence. Or it could just be somebody who just says, you know, I've always been bad-tempered and there's nothing I can do about it. I was born with a bad temper. This is an inherent part of me. I can't do anything. Yeah, so somebody could have that kind of attitude, too. Yeah. So they don't try to remedy their situation, and as a result, they continue to be reborn in samsara. Understanding that attaining true cessation is possible by eliminating afflictions and karma dispels the misconception that liberation does not exist immediately freeing us from a defeatist and often cynical attitude. So it's true, isn't it? If we say, you know, this is just who I am, it's a part of me, I can't overcome it, yeah, then we're very defeatist and we can get very cynical. You know, somebody who's trying to uh, transform themselves and maybe be a kinder person, then we ridicule them. You know, like, well, who do you think you are? You know, this is, 
you know, these things are innate. Don't even try. Get rid of them. Do these misconceptions sound familiar? Have you met people who have them? Have you thought of some of them? Yeah, I have. Okay, second, nirvana is peace because it is a separation in which afflictions have been eliminated. Okay, so when we can cut off the root of the afflictions, then we have peace. Yeah, as long as the root of afflictions, the seeds of the afflictions are in our mind, uh, our mind can't really abide in actual peace because the afflictions will come up. And the reason they're called afflictions is because they disturb the peace of the mind. Okay, that's why they're called afflictions. So when they come up, that's what they do. So unable to correctly identify the qualities of liberation, that's the problem with these particular practitioners, some people mistake other polluted states such as meditative absorption in the form and formless realms as liberation. Because when you cultivate these different states that are increasingly deeper states of samadhi and increasingly more peaceful, it's very easy to mistake them for uh, liberation. Because especially when your mind, even if you're born as a human being, if your mind becomes a mind of the form realm or formless realm, even you haven't been born there yet, it's very peaceful. And you go, oh, this must be liberation. Because you've suppressed certain afflictions, but you haven't uprooted them. And so they say that many um, meditators from different um, traditions, non-Buddhist traditions, and it can happen to Buddhists as well, uh, gain these states and then think they've attained liberation. And then when they die, they have the karmic appearances again of, you know, falling to a lower rebirth. And these people completely freak out. And then they lose all faith because they thought, I've been deceived. I thought I had attained liberation. And now I'm falling to the lower realms. And, you know, I was deceived. Yeah, so very painful for them. Although, so that's why, one of the reasons why our teachers do not emphasize at the beginning of the path to sit down and try and gain serenity. You know, our teachers tell us we should try and gain an overall idea of the path and really train in renunciation, bodhicitta, the view of emptiness, get these things Uh, the seeds of these things made very clear in our mind. Yeah, and then start to work on, you know, developing serenity. That doesn't mean that we, we don't try and improve our concentration at the beginning. Yes, we always try and improve our concentration. But instead of saying, I'm going to sit down, you know, I'm going to the mountains and I'm going to develop serenity when you don't have a full understanding of the whole path, then you can still attain serenity because uh, this uh, meditation technique and these attainments are not restricted to Buddhists. Everybody can get them. So you can get that level, but then it's very easy to get attached to it. It's so peaceful. It's so blissful. That why do I have to go back and meditate on emptiness, which is so difficult to understand? And, you know, go back and think about the disadvantages of self-centeredness. 
no, I'm enjoying my, my bliss. I don't want to be disturbed. So although these meditative absorptions are more tranquil than our human existence, since uh, they have only suppressed manifest afflictions and have not eliminated subtle afflictions and their seeds from the root. Not understanding that nirvana is ultimate peace, people do not try to attain it and are satisfied with a temporary superior samsaric state. Okay. So this attribute counteracts the belief that states polluted by ignorance are nirvana. And that's part of the problem with these people who attain those states. They don't recognize them as still being polluted by ignorance, and they think that they're nirvana. People who are convinced of the harm of afflictions and karma know that their cessation is a state of peace and joy that will not vanish. And so they do not get waylaid or distracted by these uh, abiding in these states of samadhi. Okay, the number three, nirvana is magnificent because it is the superior source of benefit and bliss. So this is going to uh, counteract the idea that there's something superior to nirvana. So because nirvana is completely non-deceptive, yeah, you see things as they actually are, and no other state of liberation su supersedes it, it is supreme and magnificent. Okay. Nirvana is total freedom from all three types of dukkha. Wouldn't that be nice? I mean, about, imagine that you're never born with this kind of body and with your, your totally confused mind. <clears throat> imagine that you're totally free of craving. So your mind doesn't get all bent out of shape with, I want this, I need that, somebody else has more and better than I do, I should have it. You're free of all that. You're free of anger and jealousy. So anybody can say anything they want to you, and you are your mind is like still water. Wouldn't that be nice? Okay. So that's why nirvana is the superior source of benefit and bliss. Okay. And there's nothing higher than that, yeah, according to the view uh, common to all the Buddhist traditions. So knowing this prevents mistaking certain states of temporary or partial cessation as nirvana. So maybe you become a stream enterer and, or, or a once returner, yeah, or even a non-returner, and you say, oh, this is so peaceful. I like this. Okay, this must be nirvana. Yeah, and you haven't realized that you haven't cut off all the afflictions from the root yet. So but when you understand this attribute of nirvana, it also prevents thinking that there is some state superior to the cessation of dukkha and its origins. Yeah. So someone who mistakes a samsaric state as liberation will follow uh, a detour that does not lead to their destination. For example, someone who enjoys the tranquility of suppressing the conceptual mind in blank-minded meditation does himself a disservice because nirvana will elude him. So this is something J. Tsongkhapa emphasized so much again and again because there were uh, people in Tibet that were teaching blank-minded meditation. And this is what the whole debate at Samye was about. 
and uh, you know, just saying you have to banish all conceptions from your mind because all conceptions are based on grasping and, uh, you know, and nirvana, you know, the peaceful state is just a total non-conceptual mind. Now, it's true, nirvana is non-conceptual, but the nirvana is non-conceptual because you've eradicated all the afflictions from the root. Blank-minded meditation is non-conceptual because you've suppressed all the afflictions. Okay, you haven't uprooted them. And so you're just kind of zoned out, I guess. Yeah, like, you know, I don't think anything. It, it, you know, you have to admit it is kind of peaceful to not think anything, isn't it? Yeah, especially when your mind's going, you know, 4,000 miles an hour, this and this, and blah, 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 blah. It's like, oh, you know, if there's a respite from all that chatter. But that's not nirvana. And then the fourth uh, attribute, nirvana is freedom or definite emergence because it is total irreversible release from samsara. So if you're concerned that you can attain liberation and then you kind of forget it or you forget what you learned or the afflictions kind of creep back in, yeah, this will help us see that that's not possible. Now, at lower stages of the path, yeah, before we've realized emptiness, we can suppress different afflictions but they will come back again. And even uh, like yesterday or the day before when we were talking about factor cessation by factor substitution, so we can apply the antidote to an affliction, our mind gets calm again, but then we see something else and that same affliction goes blah, okay? So it, the afflictions will come back like that. That's why we really need to uh, completely cut the root of ignorance, not just inhibit it temp temporarily. Okay, so nirvana is a definite abandonment because it is an irrevocable release from samsara's dukkha. This counters the mistaken notion that nirvana can degenerate. Because nirvana is the elimination of all afflictions and karma causing samsaric rebirth, there no longer exists any cause for such rebirth or for the suffering, the dukkha it entails. Okay, So when the cause has been obliterated, the result cannot happen. So contemplating these four attributes encourages us not to stop part way, not to be satisfied with just attaining path of seeing or whatever, okay, but to really follow the path to the end. Okay, to, so encourage us to, us to not stop part way, but to continue practicing until we actualize full nirvana. And then the chart below, you know, similar to the other ones, you have the distorted conceptions of that uh, truth and then the attributes of that truth that counteract it. Okay, and then the reflection. To get a small taste of what nirvana could be like, Imagine that an affliction such as anger is totally absent from your mind. No matter what someone says or does, no matter what happens, even your body's chopped to bits, you will never get angry again. Whew. 
relief, huh? Then the second point, nirvana is the complete absence of all afflictions forever. Aspire to attain it. But if you're following the Mahayana path, don't think that you're going to stop there. Always aim for full awakening. So for the four attributes of Traduka, I feel like I have some grasp of the syllogism and I can reflect on it and and it feels a certain way. For the four attributes of true cessations and true origins, much like the syllogism you're discussing with it's the causes because it's the chief causes, when I try to reflect on them, I feel like I don't have enough understanding of the syllogism to to get yeah. anywhere with it. So yeah. I was wondering if you have advice on how to make progress with these since I've found this very difficult. Yeah, keep studying, asking questions, and contemplating. Yeah, This is, this is the whole thing. We have to realize that we're not going to understand everything the first time we hear it. Yeah, So we have to go back over it again and again and again and really think about things deeply and discuss it, and ask questions. And it takes time, you know, to, to, I mean, when you really think of how long we've been in samsara, and that we've never considered these kind of ideas before. Or if we considered them, we didn't go very far with them, because we certainly didn't abandon anything. Okay? So if that's the state we're in, you know, it's going to take a while. Okay? So, um, you know, we just have to be content with studying, reflecting, meditating, studying some more, reflecting some more, meditating some more. Yeah? I hear the scientists, you know, maybe a Johnson & Johnson, you know, are trying to develop a pill that we can take that it is called insta-realizations. And you take it, and then your afflictions are abolished, and you have instant realizations that come very easily. Yeah? So, you know, after COVID, we just have to beat, uh, you know, all the afflictions from beginningless time. And uh, they're working on it. Okay? This is our mind, isn't it? We think that somehow we should be able to develop something that makes the whole process quicker. And why not a pill? (laughs) Yeah. Because we develop pills for almost everything else, you know, if it's not a pill, well, it's an, in an infusion, you know, or maybe surgery. Maybe they can cut open our brain and take out the anger. Yeah, sew us back up. Yeah, and, and hope that they added some compassion into the brain tissue while they did the surgery. You know, our whole way of looking at things is, and our school system is, You hear it, you understand it perfectly, and you that's you can and you can spit it back out and it makes total sense to you. And this is where we get stuck. Yeah. And we get frustrated. You know, it's like I've been studying Dharma three years and I still don't understand what nirvana is. And somebody else goes, Well, I've been studying it three lifetimes, and I don't understand. And somebody else says, well, I've been studying it three eons, you know, and I'm still working on it. So, mm -hmm. sorry if I popped the bubble. (laughs) Uh Uh-huh. What is the object of focus in a blank-minded meditation? Nothingness. Yeah, or just some non vague, non-conceptual state. Yeah, 
um, the perception and non-perception. It's like one of those form. Yeah, realm there is one one, uh, one realm where they, you know, it's neither perception nor non-perception. There's another realm called the base of nothingness. So they all have some kind of variety of, you know, shutting down these conceptual processes. Mm-hmm. I cannot tell you the details. Now somebody who did many years of um, a certain type of meditation and um, he did not have an object, but um, he was a Zen practitioner, but I don't know if that's the Zen practice per se, but um, saying that he tried to just stay in the moment and um, you know not falling thoughts and just being present and, but being aware and so he did that for a long long time for years and then he told me you know I have the same afflictions coming up I don't have anything to work with that mm. and I'm sick of it so then he said okay I need to do something else that actually helps me counteracting yeah. what is coming up again and again yeah 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 they say that's what happens yeah. Okay, are we ready to go on to true paths? Four attributes of true paths. So the true path is the wisdom realizing the 16 attributes of the four truths, especially true cessation. So this is the common one for all the Buddhist uh, t- tenant systems. Okay, it's the wisdom realizing the 16 attributes of the four truths, especially true cessation. So everything that we've gone through so far, this is what you realize, plus the four that are coming up for true paths. Okay, existing in the mind streams of aryas of all three vehicles, the hearer, Solitary realizer, bodhisattva vehicle. True paths eradicate ignorance and other afflictions. When afflictions cease, polluted uh, karma is no longer created, and that which has already been created cannot ripen into a samsaric rebirth. So liberation is attained. So our so our hearts, for example. Yeah, before they become arhats, you know, as ordinary beings, they created lots of karma to take rebirth in various places in samsara, lower rebirths, higher rebirths, and so on. So some of those karmas have been purified, yeah. Some of them are still on the mind stream, okay, they, but those are those arhats cannot be reborn in samsara because there's no more craving and clinging. So when we talk about the um, twelve links of dependent arising, it comes later in the book. These two links are the eighth and the ninth, craving and clinging, and they are what make the the karma ripen so that it propels us into another rebirth. So you may have the karmic seeds on the mind stream, but when craving and clinging have been eliminated, those seeds can no longer ripen. Okay? So that's the situation of an arhat. Those seeds are still there, but they cannot ripen. In Buddhahood, all those seeds are completely gone. Mm-hmm. Okay, the Pali tradition says that the Arya's eightfold path constitutes true paths. What Prasangika say, it is an Arya's realization informed by the wisdom directly realizing the emptiness of inherent existence. So they have slightly different ideas of what the true paths are. The wisdom realizing emptiness is the principal true path because it it views phenomena's mode of existence 
opposite to the way ignorance does. So the object that ignorance apprehends, yeah, it apprehends things as existing inherently. The way this wisdom apprehends things is they lack inherent existence. They are empty of it. Okay? So the wisdom that we're trying to cultivate is the total opposite of how ignorance apprehends things. Okay? So when you think about this, then you see why it's going to take some time because the ignorance has been in the mind a long time. We, you know, things appear to us inherently existent. We assent to that appearance and we grasp them as existing in that way. And we have to break that very strong habit by seeing that what we are perceiving does not exist. That doesn't mean nothing exists, but it means that the false objects that are appearing to us that we grasp as existing, those inherently existent objects do not exist. Okay? So it's, it's a direct, the wisdom, it directly counteracts the ignorance. It's not chipping away at it, hitting it on the side. It's not going under it or over it or dropping some chemical on it. It's completely directly hitting it. Okay? So while ignorance grasps inherent existence, the wisdom directly realizing emptiness realizes the absence of inherent existence. In this way, it is able to completely counteract ignorance and all the afflictions rooted in it. So now we're talking about the, from the Prasangika viewpoint, okay? So as above, uh, these four attributes of true paths assuage doubts that we may have about the true path. If you fear that there is no path to peace, reflect on the first attribute. If you think that the wisdom realizing emptiness cannot counteract the afflictions, reflect on the second attribute. If you wonder if the wisdom realizing emptiness will actually eliminate the afflictions, ponder the third attribute. And if you wonder if meditating with the wisdom realizing emptiness will bring nirvana and not some other state, reflect on the fourth attribute. So you can see, you know, with all these, that people have certain doubts about, about this, you know? Like, does this exist? Does it work? You know? And so these 16 attributes counteract these kind of doubts and misconceptions. And that's important because if we have doubts about the path, it's going to be hard to realize the path. Okay? Because, you know, in the process of gaining realizations, we start out with our wrong conceptions. Then we meditate some more, we go from wrong conceptions to doubt. But the doubt is inclined towards the wrong idea. Then we go, we practice some more, we get to doubt that's, well, maybe it's this, maybe it's that. Then we practice some more, we get to doubt that's inclined towards the right idea. But it's still doubt. Like, well, yeah, that kind of makes sense, but I'm not really sure about it. Then you still continue to ponder, practice, learn, study. You get a correct assumption. So this is a mind state that you understand the basics and the syllogism makes sense to you, but it doesn't, it hasn't penetrated into your core. And it's still an intellectual yeah, thing. And there's many, many different, uh, there's a whole variety 
of um, correct assumptions. Yeah, where at first, like, yeah, I think it's like this, and then a little bit more, mm, yeah, that seems right, and then maybe you can talk about it some, and then you, you know, you become a professor, and you can, you know, blah, blah about it, and write papers, and get tenure, um, but you don't live according to it, and it hasn't penetrated your mind, okay? Then at some point was you're practicing more and more and, you know, and you have a very strong wish to get out of samsara because you've meditated on true dukkha and true origins, you know, and, and you know that there, there's an alternative in true cessations. Then you reach an inference, okay? So an inferential understanding is still conceptual, but you really understand the inference and it shakes you. It's like when you go like, oh, wow, you know, like I've always assumed that everything I see and think exists in a certain matter and I've never questioned it. And wow, I was wrong. Yeah. Kind of, I would imagine that it would be like, you know, they're, they're, you have a best friend and you think this friend is wonderful and, you know, you have a great relationship and then you find out that they're a crook and they've been stealing things from you. And the shock of like, whoa, I thought you were like this and now it turns out that you're the opposite. Okay? So it must be something kind of like that where you're, you know, but even more so. Mm -hmm. Okay. But you're not meditating on the feeling of shock. Yeah, the feeling of shock is not the realization of, of emptiness. Okay, so don't just think, oh, I've got to create a feeling of like this. That That's not the realization. Okay. You have to go through the whole process, identifying the object of negation, the pervasion, and all those things. Okay. And then you meditate. Uh, you bring in your serenity at that point, yeah, so that you can keep your mind on the conclusion from uh, the inference without your mind going all over the place and losing the object of meditation. And that ability to stay on it single-pointedly makes that, you know, then that's when it starts really going into your mind and it starts really to counteract the afflictions. So you have to meditate like that with the combination, uh, the union of serenity and insight, yeah? And then from that, at some point, you're able, because this the inference is, is, a, is still a conceptual mind. It's not direct perception. It's still conceptual. At some point, you're able to break through that and see emptiness directly. And with that realization, you know, first you counteract the, the acquired afflictions, then you start counteracting the various levels of innate afflictions. And then if you're on the path to Buddhahood, then you counteract the cognitive afflictions. Okay, so it's this gradual thing. Yeah. We like to think like, well, I realized emptiness. Okay, I see reality. Uh, you know, all my wrong conceptions are gone. Uh, I've completely transformed my mind. And now I am a holy being. What's next on my list? <laughs> okay. So it's not like that. So the four attributes of true paths are path, suitable, accomplishment, and deliverance. And these are explained according to the Prasangika viewpoint below. So let's pause here. And any questions or comments?
just have a small point of clarification. So we were talking about our hots still having afflictions on their mind stream, but not, no condition to bring them about. Mm -hmm. Is that true of bodhisattvas as well when they hit the eighth ground? Um, yeah. Yeah. Because you still have the, the, um, the latencies of the afflictions. But what on about the my, afflictions? Uh, at, on the eighth ground, you, the afflictions have been, okay. and their seeds have been, uh, cut. But the latencies of the afflictions are still there. And there might still be some karmic remnants hanging out, you know? And, and so you're working to, to purify all the remaining stuff. Mm hmm. I mean, I, I think by the eighth ground that any seeds of karma are, uh, you know, are pretty weak, but there are probably still some things hanging out there, seeds of karma. When I'm thinking about emptiness, sometimes I'm overcome by a lot of fear. So recently, it almost felt like my mind says, don't go there. It's dangerous. It's a poison. Stay away from it. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I don't know how to work with that state, that like huge aversion to and the fear. D what were you having a reaction of fear too. I think it's threatening the ego. Okay. Well, you mean you, like just thinking about the teachings was causing fear in you? Um, it was, um, I would say casual contemplation when I was either walking or just lying down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you were thinking about the teachings. Emptiness. About yeah. emptiness. Oh, okay. Okay. Okay, now I get it. Uh, yeah, that's, that's, um, not uncommon, I think, because, uh, for, for a couple of reasons. First of all, we, um, haven't identified the object of negation correctly, necessarily. And so we think, uh, that there's nothing that exists. And that idea that, oh, then I, there's, there's no me whatsoever. Not just there's no inherently existent me, but there's no me at all. Okay. And then that uh, elicits a feeling of fear of losing ourselves. Okay. So, um, so that can happen. That's why, uh, we need to do a lot of purification and creation of merit. Because as we purify and create merit, our refuge, you know, deepens because we understand what emptiness is, what the realization of emptiness is. That understanding grows. As the understanding grows, then we're not so liable to be afraid of it. Yeah, and we can begin to see that as, uh, you know, as something that can liberate us. Okay. So, you know, direct your, your attention towards purification and creation of merit. And, and, you know, and really growing your refuge in the Buddha Dharma Sangha. Can you expand a little bit on what the Pali tradition says that the Arya's eightfold path, Arya's eightfold path constitutes, constitutes true paths? Like at what point um, I mean, because we hear the Eightfold Noble Path quite a lot, but we're not talking about the Arya, Arya Path at that point. We're talking about what ordinary beings do to just try to get on the path. So what is the Arya's Path in the Pali tradition? Okay. So when we call it the Eightfold Noble Path, remember noble means Arya. So they're really talking about the path in the Arya's mind stream. But... That doesn't mean we as ordinary beings not practice a similitude and familiarize ourselves with those things so that we can actually uh, realize the, the real Arya of Eightfold Path. But Even in the Arya Path, only right view is a realization of emptiness, I would guess, and the rest mm -hmm. are yeah. informed by that? Uh, yeah, they're informed by that. 
And there are also qualities that are necessary in order to become an arhat. Yeah. In other words, it's not just the wisdom seeing and the, you know, the lack of a self-sufficient, substantially existent person. You also have to have the right intention, the right action, and all these other attributes. Okay. Yeah. We like to think sometimes that, you know, there's just one thing to meditate on. And that one thing will, you know, clear up the whole thing. And His Holiness always says our minds are so complicated that one kind of meditation or one realization is not going to do the whole thing. You know, it's we have to develop many different aspects of our consciousness. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Is nirvana achieved in this desire realm, or must one be in a different realm? Um, you can attain it in the desire realm, with your body in the desire realm, but your consciousness has to be an upper a consciousness of an upper realm. So what this means is you can be a human being. And when you are doing these meditations to develop serenity and deeper levels of concentration, yeah, your mind can change according to the level of concentration to be, uh, let's say, a mind of the first dhyana, the first uh, level of the, of the form realm or the second dhyana, or the third, or the fourth. And then there's the different levels of the formless realm. So you can have a body that's in a human being, and you've, uh, a human body, and you practiced the, the, the methods to develop samadhi very intensely as a human being. Your body is still a desire realm body. But your mind, when you go into those states of concentration, becomes a consciousness of one of the higher realms, okay? So to realize emptiness directly, they usually say uh, you have, uh, at least on the um, bodhisattva path, it has to be uh, the fourth dhyana. To realize it directly, if you're on the hero or solitary realizer path, you have to have uh, at least a preparation to the first dhyana. So we'll get into all those different stages in the next volume. Okay, lots to get confused about there. <laughs> and for those who are drawn to meditate on nothingness, do they have a severe case of nihilism? They can very really easily fall into nihilism. You know, they probably are just seeking some mental peace or maybe they, you know, want to be known as a great meditator who can stay on moving for a long time. I don't know what motivates and moves these people. Or maybe they haven't met a teacher that has actually explained the path accurately to them and so they sincerely believe that... Uh, you know, eliminating all concepts is is all you need to do to attain awakening. Okay. It's true that awakening is non-conceptual and free from all these conceptualizations. Okay. But just removing uh, the gross conceptualizations isn't cutting the the grasping at inherent existence. Okay, so we'll stop here.